Okay, now we are well into um, the, this novel and we are looking at uh, uh, part three, which is from the perspective, as we saw last time, of Bryony. We saw part one, we have a changing perspective that shifts with each chapter. Part two, focus upon Robbie. Part three, focus upon Bryony. And all of these are told from what perspective? Third-person perspective, right? That's the voice of the, of the novel to this point has been all third-person perspective, right? It's not Robbie saying, I did this in part two, or Bryony saying, I did this in part three. It's all from the third-person perspective. And we saw why that was important, because especially as we looked at the way in which the characters think about certain situations, how they think about other characters, we saw that whenever we have someone thinking about their own life and their own events and their own ways of looking at the world, that there's a certain inbuilt bias to the way in which humans think, right? Is that when we want to say something, we tell it from our own perspective and it's colored by our own values about by who we are, by our upbringing, by our background, all sorts of things that influence that we can't help. We can't be completely scientifically, you know, absolutely objective. So we saw that that idea of perspective is very important to, um, to the novel. Now, um, we've, we've learned along the way that there have been a number of twists and turns, right? There have been moments of, uh, of great importance in the narrative. So we saw in chapter 13 and 14, for example, where we have the accusation by Bryony of Robbie, right? It's one of the key moments in the story, right? All the things sort of build up to this moment in part one. We saw that we have further um, sort of revelations as to the motivations and ideas and connections between characters in part two and part three. So, for example, one of the big uh, things that was not, for some reason, was not mentioned in part one, but we saw mentioned in part two, was the whole drowning or swimming incident with Bryony and Robbie, right? In which we are told that, you know, three years earlier that uh, Bryony had had this big crush on Robbie. So there are lots of secrets, there are lots of things that are revealed in the course of the novel, right? And these continue to happen all the way through to the end, right? So even the, even the end, when we, when we come here for next Thursday, when we read that last, the last section of the book, even then there are some more surprises and some more revelations that will come out about like the nature of the story and what, has, what happens to the characters and and who they are and how they're connected to each other, right? Um, and one of the things that, you know, because I've, uh, some of you I imagine, or most of you are reading this for the first time. Some of you I know have seen the film, which reveals some things, but not all things, right? Because the film, by nature, has to skip over certain details, right? Otherwise, it would be too long. Um, but, uh, but, one of the things that comes from rereading this book, and I've read this book a number of times now, um, is that you start to see that there are certain clues, right? There are certain clues that go along the way that point towards all these secrets, all these things that are happening in the novel, even the final um, twists and turns that happen in the last few pages, all right? So um, this is a, this is a, a book that, and this is, this is something I'm going to treat in the lecture today, that is, and we've seen, we've talked a bit about this before, is about revealing things, but also concealing things, right? And the way in which, in some ways, in a work of fiction, it's possible to do both of these things at the same time, right? It's possible to reveal something and also to conceal something, right? In the same movement, in the same gesture. Okay, so, first of all, just a couple of uh, um, bits of slang, or in this case, more sort of uh, um, British idiom. So when, uh, <coughs> this is a particularly British term, when British people say they're smalls, they mean they're underwear, right? So, so it's like if you've packed your, uh, your baggage, your luggage, right? This is your smalls, it means your, your underwear. And uh, in turn, um, on page 155, nippers, right, which you can find um, 
The one on 153 is right at the bottom, in that bottom paragraph where we continued the story. Um, let's see, oh, it's right, second last line of that first paragraph on 155. Mentions the, uh, I had six nippers. Remember, this is, uh, she's speaking with a fake Cockney accent, with a Cockney, well, not with a fake Cockney, a real Cockney accent. Um, and uh, this is sort of a, a term, a slang term from, from Cockney. So nippers means children. Right? It's meant to be like, they're supposed to be like, the idea is that they're small, right? <laughs> and all they can do is nip, they can't really bite. Right? The little nippers. Okay, so as I said, today um, the theme I wanna focus on is that one that we've looked at a little bit before, right? And remember I talked about this <clears throat> idea, for example, with the, um, when I talked about light and darkness and the moths, Right? Remember the, the example in, um, in Emily Tallis's chapter, right? chapter six, where she's thinking about like, the, the dinner she went to and talking, about, talking to the, the biologist about, um, about the moths and why, why do moths fly, into flame, fly around flames or fly into flames. Right? And she's like, this, is, this seems a very weird phenomenon. I, why would, you know, we would think that most like animals have an instinct to preserve themselves and to, to save their lives, but here we have moths that spend all their time doing something that's both useless and quite dangerous, and like they can die from that, of course, right? And the, uh, the scientist explains to her, oh, well, it's because there's a sort of an error in the way in which moths perceive like time and space and light, and they think that beyond the light is the darkest place, right? And so they have this illusion, oh, it looks darker over there, and they fly over to this side. And now they see on the other side of the light, oh, wait, no, it looks darker over there. And they fly over to there, and they keep making the same mistake over and over again, right? They have, as he puts it, this impression of a, of a deeper darkness that's on the other side, that, but is actually an illusion, something that isn't really there. So if we go back right to the very beginning of the book, right, we see that there are some clues about the nature of, of secrets and even some passages, as we'll see in a moment, that when we get to the end of the book, we can look back on and we say, well, that's a very big clue. But one of the things about clues that happen in the first couple of pages of the book is that we don't know anything about the characters at that point. We don't know anything about the story. and so we easily overlook these things, right? So it's when we come back and, and reread a book like Atonement that we're like, wait a minute, there's a clue right there, right? I, I could see, I should, have, I should have known that was coming, but I couldn't because I couldn't see it at the time. All right, so remember we, we see on, on, this is on page two of our, of our course packet, we see, um, and very early on in, in the novel, we see, um, that Bryony is someone who is fascinated with secrets, right? So we're given a couple of, um, of, of passages here in which McEwen like, explains this idea about her. Right? She has these sort of these childish secrets that she likes. So it says, the taste for the miniature was one aspect of an orderly spirit. Another was a passion for secrets. In a prized varnish cabinet, a secret drawer was opened by pushing against the grain of a cleverly turned dovetail joint. And here she kept a diary locked by a clasp. And a notebook written in a code of her own invention. In a toy safe, opened by six secret numbers, she stored letters and postcards. An old tin petty cash box was hidden. Petty cash means uh, small amounts of cash. Uh, was hidden under a removable floorboard beneath her bed. In the box were treasures that dated back four years to her ninth birthday when she began collecting. A mutant double acorn, fool's gold, a rain-making spell she bought at a fun fair, a squirrel's skull as light as a leaf. Look at that top part there, the notebook written in a code of her own invention. Is there something in part three that she does that's similar to this? What does she do? 
right, she still, she keeps her, her journal, keeps her diary, but instead of um, using the real names, right, she disguises the, the names of the people, she changes certain things to fictionalize, to, to, um, to make it so that it's concealed that who she's really talking about, right? So this practice that we see in part three of writing in code about the things around her and what she sees, right, we see that it's already happening here, right? She's already started doing that. Um, now, in this case, it means that she's writing in an actual code, right? She's like trying to write a secret code so like no one can easily read it, like, you know, sort of a spy code sort of thing. But nonetheless, there is this parallel between what's happening there too, okay? Now we see about these secrets that at, th at this early stage of the novel that the secrets are not really worth much. Right, and you can see the the list that we're sort of given there. They're all they're all kinds of you know kind of useless things. A double acorn, like an acorn that's kind of like you know normally an acorn is just one, but these two have sort of like grown together, merged together. Um, fool's gold, right? So you can like if you're looking for gold, you can sometimes find um, bits of like iron oxide that look like they glitter like gold, but they're worthless. They're not worth anything. Fool's gold. Um, a rain-making spell and a squirrel skull, right? These are all worthless, useless. So um, this is what Bryony realizes too about her, her secrets. But hidden drawers, lockable diaries, and cryptographic systems could not conceal from Bryony the simple truth. She had no secrets. Her wish for a harmonious, organized world denied her the reckless possibilities of wrongdoing. Mayhem and destruction were too chaotic for her tastes and she did not have it in her to be cruel. Does Bryony have it in her to be cruel? Ah, see this is, again, when you read this sentence later on and you think, wait a minute, yeah, what did she did to Robbie? Was that not cruel? Right, so this is one of those things where you, when you're rereading and you see some of the the way in which the, the language and the, the opinions and ideas that McEwen gives to us, and we reread them with later knowledge, they also change for us, right? They've given a new perspective. So even us as readers, when we think about that question of perspective, right? When we think about like how we read this sentence for the first time and now coming back to read it, even though it's the same words, with the new knowledge that we have, with the new background that we have, even our perspective, even our way that we interpret these things has changed, right? So this reflects not only the way in which the characters in the book and how their perspective changes things, it's also us as readers, we also think this way, right? We also have this shifting perspective that changes how we see the world. Now, these, these two passages set up something that, as I said, when we come back to it at the very end of, of the novel, it's going to be particularly important, this, this section. Also, right at the beginning. Um, and it talks about the way in which Bryony sort of, she finds that in telling her stories, she's able to, like, sort of hide herself in them, right? So it's like, oh, I've created this character called Arabella. It's not me, it's Arabella, right? It's someone else. But then at the same time, she's able to, as she's trying to conceal herself, right, these characters and these stories are very obviously about her. And anyone who reads them right, can immediately say, well, okay, Bryony, but you know, obviously Arabella is meant to be you, right? Okay. So in this passage, as I said, we start to see this interplay between revelation and concealment. She's hiding behind a fictional character, like Arabella, like in her play. And at the same time, by, even though she's concealed herself behind this character, this persona that she's created for herself, nonetheless, it re still reveals something about the author, about, about uh, Bryony as a person. Right? So let me read this, this passage. At the age of 11, she wrote her first story, A Foolish Affair imitative of half a dozen folk tales and lacking, she realized later that vital knowingness about the ways of the world, which compels a reader's respect. But this first clumsy attempt showed her 
that the imagination itself was a source of secrets. Right? The secret theme again. Once she had begun a story, no one could be told. Pretending in words was too tentative, too vulnerable, too embarrassing to let anyone know. Even writing out the she said S, the, the and then the, 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 yeah, this is all in italics in the original, made her wince and then, and she felt foolish, appearing to know about the emotions of an imaginary being. Self-exposure was inevitable the moment she described the character's weakness. The reader was bound to speculate that she was describing herself. What other authority could she have? Right. So, remember we, we talked about in the, the, the drowning scene, right, when we got to that in part two, we went back and we looked at how very early in the story, Bryony writes the story about like the, the woodcutter who saves the princess from drowning. And we see, oh, wait a minute. This story is almost certainly inspired by that scene, by the, the fake drowning scene, right? the swimming scene. Um, so when she is writing these stories, she says, I can conceal myself behind a fiction. I can conceal myself behind these characters. Right? I can pretend, oh, no, this is not about me. This is about some other character. Right? But we see here that she realizes that, oh, as soon as someone sees that character, they're going to say, well, wait a minute. How does that character know about those things? How does that character, why does that character have those feelings? How does it know about these parts of the world? How does it know about these experiences? How does it know about these feelings? Ah, because Bryony must know about that. Right? That's the only way. Right? Bryony created this character. Therefore, this character has some part of Bryony in her. Right. Now, remember, as it says here, remember, this is Bryony writing her first story. Right. And her first story, she realizes, is very, as you would expect, from someone who's young and inexperienced and you know, just starting out at this whole you know, writing business, is that she realizes that like, she's not very good at hiding herself in the writing, right? At concealing herself in these characters, right? These characters are too obviously transparently her and her feelings and her situations and things that have happened to her that she's just then changed the names and changed the locations so that you know, now instead of being Bryony, it's a princess. Instead of being Robbie, it's a woodcutter, right? Instead of being down by the by the weir, it's now like a, a river. Okay. So she just changes small details, but it's still very obviously things that have happened to her. To her. So we, can, we start to see that, as I said, these things, on the one hand, they conceal and reveal at the same time. They hide behind fiction, but they also reveal something about the author. But also, Bryony's inexperience as a young girl writing these stories means that she's not very good at concealing herself. Does Bryony go on to become a better writer? What are we told about that? Chapter 3, right? Remember that flash forward? We're told that she goes on to a very successful career as a writer later in her life, right? So you can imagine that, like, She's not going to keep writing like her 11-year-old self, is she? Right? Her technique and her style and her ability to hide herself in her fiction, right? to make, that, make it so it's not just obviously everything is about her, right? becomes like, more and more skillful, right? more and more hidden. And so the connection between um, the, the things that she can, that she can write and we see her developing this skill as well in part three as well with, the, with her journal, right? Is that the more experienced, the more skillful she is, the more she has written, right? The more she's able to um, hide herself in her fiction, even as she reveals her own feelings and ideas and so on. So this is something, as I said, this is something that is not just about like Bryony or about like um, 
you know, this particular author, but is something that is true about any work of fiction, right? To some extent, we all, as writers, if, we, if any of us were to write a novel, or if any author out there is writing a novel, we all have to draw from our knowledge and from our experiences and from who we are, right? So there's, to some extent, that there's some kind of revelation about ourselves, what we choose to write about, the kinds of ideas we engage with, the kinds of stories that we would tell as authors, but also we could seal them cleverly. The, more, the better author we are, the more cleverly we can hide behind like, those kinds of different personas. Right? It's one of, the, one, of the, one of the many reasons why um, Shakespeare is considered to be such a great author, right? is that he's able to create such a huge range of different kinds of characters. Goes from you know psychopaths like Macbeth to like depressed tragic young men like Hamlet to like comic figures like Malvolio, right? Who's a fool, right? All across the range of all sorts of different very memorable sorts of characters, right? all ages, all genders, right? Um, that he's able to to create. So if we if we look at his characters, we can't just say, oh well, obviously, you know, if we read Hamlet. Shakespeare must have been like Hamlet. But wait a minute, how could he be like Hamlet if he also wrote Macbeth or Othello or like these other characters, right? So he's very good at hiding himself behind these very complex characters. Obviously, they all have some aspect of Shakespeare within them, but they're hidden. It's hidden in behind these fictional creations in such a cunning way that we really can only speculate as to how much he draws upon himself for that. So, as I said, there is, this, there is this secret at the center of atonement that is gradually being unraveled, right? And that will be, you know, of course, by, by the time we get to the end of the novel, we'll know all of the secrets that, um, that uh, are provided to us within the course of the novel. But if we go back and we look through or we reread this novel, we continually come across little hints Right? And sometimes big hints like this one, that there are other secrets. Now we also have McEwen um, providing us with the theme and, and symbols of secrets as well all the way through the novel. Right? So there are of course questions that we can ask, like for example, who attacked Lola? Right? At this stage in the novel, we have some, uh, you know, we have some pretty big clues, right? but nothing absolutely 100% confirmed for us. Right, so in part one, when we got to the end of part one, we we're speculating, well, it could be Danny Hardman, right? He's described like, you know, he's this sort of, you know, teenager who seems kind of, you know, naughty and lustful and he was hanging around and looking at Lola at the pool and so on. Could be Paul Marshall, right? Because he was, you know, talking to Lola and being all flirty with her and she was flirting back and then we see the scratch on his face, so it could be him, right? Now in part three, we've seen you know, a bit more confirmation of that, th the Paul Marshall theory with right, Lola and Paul Marshall getting married, right? and Bryony sort of saying, mm, did I do that? Was that me? Right? Did I allow that to happen? Was I the one that brought them together? I'd allow them to, to have, you know, have this relationship. So who attacked Lola? Um, we also are asking ourselves, well, why did Bryony accuse Robbie? Right? Why did she do what she did? Was it because she was in love with him, like we see from the, the swimming scene? Was that, that, remember, that's Robbie's theory. Robbie's theory is that Bryony has this big crush on him and that's why she did it. Um, but we also know that it's also possible that it, that's not the reason. So it's left uncertain for us. Um, we can see with the moths, right? What are the moths seeing? Are they really seeing a deeper darkness? Is that real? Is it just an illusion? What is, what is being concealed here? So atonement plays with our uncertainties all the way through. We're left unsure about certain things. Right? And if we rush to judgment, then we sort of, we, we end up being sort of like Bryony, accusing, accusing things or making um, you know, uh, judgments based upon evidence that we don't have. Right? Remember when she says, uh, when she says, oh yeah, I knew it was 
Robbie, and they're like, well, did you actually see? Well, no, I didn't see him, but I knew it was, right? In the same way, we, we've got to be careful if we, at this stage to say, oh, well, I know it was Paul Marshall, right? Well, did you see him? No, but I just know, right? We would be doing exactly the same thing as Bryony if we made that kind of judgment, right? So we also see that there are various symbols scattered throughout the, the story that also contain sort of secrets. Some of them are deliberately concealed. Others of them are things that have become secret because no one, like they've been neglected and no one knows about them anymore, right? So for example, we see the, the island temple, right? Remember the island temple was part of the old house, right? And then, um, and it was meant to complement the style of the old house as, as the fountain and the other things that were outside um, in the gardens, uh, in the grounds of the house were supposed to, right? This neoclassical style, this 18th century style. And then the 18th century style house burns down and is rebuilt in a more modern sort of style. But these things that were outside that were meant to complement the original house are still there. And so their function is kind of lost. Right? What is this island temple for anyway? What, why is it even there? Right? And it's sort of, it's left the, to, to sort of like fall apart. Remember we, we learned that, um, that Leon and Robbie and so on, when they were kids, they like threw stones at the windows and smashed them all. The roof is falling in. Animals are coming inside. Right? So this temple has sort of lost its original function. Right? It's not, um, it's sort of, what is its purpose? It's kind of a mystery. Why is it there? What's it even for? And of course, this mystery becomes then doubled by the fact that um, it's the place where Lola is attacked, right? So there's also this other mystery. What happened there? Right? So those two things are attached. Um, similarly, we have some other bits of um, uh, other mysteries, other secrets about the, the Talus family too. Do you remember there's the scene in um, where the, their living room is described? They have the big painting on the wall, right? Also done in 18th century style. Who was that painting of? What, what did it show in the painting? Anyone remember? It was a family, right? Done in Gainsborough style, as I said. This is a famous portrait painter from the 18th century. But do, they, do the Talises know who this family is? They have no idea, right? It's a big, expensive painting. It looks nice on the wall, but they have no idea who this, who this family is in the painting, right? And similarly, and we're going to go over this uh, at some point to, to look, at, look a bit more at the, at the Talises, um, probably next time, um, to see a bit more into their, into their history. Because there are certain things that are concealed about their background, right? About who they are and where they have come from. So one of the, one of the bits of symbolism that McEwen gives to us about the Tallis family is the profession of their grandfather, right? Whom we're told is the one who sort of makes the family money, makes them rich. And the way that he does it is that he designs a number of different kinds of locks. He's a, a locksmith. Um, and of course, what are locks for? Locking up things, right? Concealing things, hiding things, right? So obviously they also keep things secure too, but very often locks are used just like Bryony does with her, like, you know, her treasures, right? She locks them up, right? She conceals them. And so, yeah, we see here, this is the, the quote that, that tells us about this. Cecilia's grandfather, who grew up over an ironmonger's shop and made the family fortune with a series of patents on padlocks, bolts, latches, and hasps, all different kinds of you know, uh, things for keeping things locked, um, had imposed on the new house his taste for all things solid, secure, and functional. So, there's a sense in which like the, the Talos family and its past is sort of locked up, kept secret. And we're going to look to unlock some of those secrets as well. 
Okay, so how, how does this then relate to what we see today in part three? Right? How does this relate to what we see in part three today? And I want to suggest the connection lies in these rather gruesome, ugly, awful descriptions that we see of the soldiers, right? The soldiers that Bryony is helping to treat in her job as a nurse. Right? Because in these, in these scenes, we see these soldiers have been so horribly disfigured, wounded, scarred, mangled by their experiences in the war, right? That their physical body, the things that we wouldn't normally see, right? Because they're concealed by our skin and by our bones and by our, you know, other things that are meant to make us <laughs> look the way that we are supposed to look, right? We want our insides to be concealed. We don't want to walk around with people being able to see inside our you know, brains, inside our eyes, inside our you know, torso, any of those parts of us. We, we don't want to see. We want those things to remain secret and concealed, don't we? No one wants to see those things. Right? So we have these very gruesome, horrible descriptions that are also meant to continue this theme, as it were, of secrets, concealment, and revelation, revealing of things. Right? So the two in particular that, that stood out um, as I was rereading for today's class, the first of these is on page uh, one, uh, 162 of your packet. Using a pair of surgical tongs, she began carefully pulling away the sodden congealed lengths of ribbon gauze from the cavity in the side of his face, right? So he's lost the side of his face. When the last was out, the resemblance to the cutaway model they used in anatomy classes was only faint, right? So have you, have you, ever, seen, have you ever seen those um, where, like, you know, medical students use them to learn about, like, the anatomy of the body? So sometimes they have a full body version where you can take out like the chest and you go, oh, look, there's where the heart goes. Oh, there's where the liver goes and so on. Well, you also can get ones of the, the head that show you, oh, here's where the brain goes and here's where the eye goes and all those sorts of things, right? So she's looking at this guy and his, half of his face is being blown off, right, by some kind of bomb. He's still alive and she says, well, you know, the things that I'm seeing here, right, uh, remind me of, of one of those models where you can see where everything is supposed to be except his is so, his is so damaged that um, he, he doesn't even start to look like those. This is all ruined, crimson and raw. She could see through his missing cheek to his upper and lower molars and the tongue glistening and hideously long. Right. Further up, where she hardly dared look, were the exposed muscles around his eye socket. So intimate and never intended to be seen. Right. So here, she's actually seeing into like the intimate secrets of this guy's face. Right? She's able to see where his tongue goes down into his throat. She's able to see into the back of like, where his eyeball is. Right? She's able to see all these things that are designed, that are meant to be concealed, right? that are meant to be hidden. Right? So there's something, she says, like intimate, something hidden, something secret, but then in this case, it's meant to be. Right? It's meant to be hidden. Not all things that are hidden are meant to be brought out into the open or are meant to be revealed. Okay. And then here, yeah, second passage that follows that same theme. Every secret, notice the term here, every secret of the body was rendered up. Bone risen through flesh, uh, sacrilegious glimpses of an intestine or an optic nerve. From this new and intimate perspective, she learned a simple obvious thing she had always known and everyone knew, that a person is, among all else, a material thing, easily torn, not easily mended. Now there's something else that's going on here besides just this question of looking at secrets of revealing and concealing things. Remember, the kinds of secrets, the kinds of things that excite Bryony in part one are things to do with the imagination, right? They're to do with the stories. They're to do with, like, you know, twists and turns in a plot 
or making up new characters that are unusual, that are different for her. But what she's seeing here in these scenes is not from the imagination. It's from real life. And this is one of the comparisons that McEwen wants us to make is, well, there is this different, very big difference between what happens in fiction, what happens in your imagination, and what happens in real life. Right? You know, if you are a novelist or a playwright, right, you can easily kill a person. You can kill a thousand people. You can kill a million people. You can kill everyone right, in the universe if you want to, without any consequences, right? You know, so, you know, when, if you, you know, the end to Hamlet, for example, is very bloody. Almost everyone in the play dies. But, at the same time, it's, those deaths are kind of, in terms of literature, are cheap deaths. It's easy, you just write it on the page, right? It's making someone die or suffer or any of those sorts of things. In the imagination, in a work of fiction, is cheap. Right? It doesn't have any consequences. Right? It doesn't have any impact on the, the real world. Whereas what Brian is continually being confronted with, with, with these ruined bodies is reality itself. Right? This is what happens when things go wrong. You can't just like you know, magically make this guy's face come back. You can't magically heal these soldiers whose bodies have been torn apart, right? You can't just use your imagination to have that kind of power over reality. And this is where imagination and reality, even though they can overlap with each other, as we've seen in both harmful and helpful ways, right? So particularly, we saw the helpful ways in, uh, in Robbie and his, the way in which he uses poetry and fiction and, and his imagination to survive during the war. But always there is this priority of the real over the imaginary. Right? That the real is not so easily fixed. If you ruin things in a story, you can just write another story. Or you can rewrite the story. You can change the story. But in real life, you can't do that. You have to live with those consequences of what you've done in real life. And of course, this is the thing that Bryony is first, first of all, and in her job as a nurse, is forced to confront over and over again, right? In part one, it was the imaginary things she was confronting. Part three, it's the real things, the things that can't be easily fixed, that she has to confront about life. And as we said before, um, it's Bryony's, uh, big mistake in part one is that she mixes those two things up, right? She mixes up the imagination. She imagines that, you know, her accusation of Robbie is inspired, as we said, by her imagining this as being just a story in which she has cast him as the villain. And in a story, as we've seen, there are no consequences. You know, oh, I don't like him being the villain. I'll make him the good guy, right? I'll rewrite the story. I'll make him, right? I could just change it. But in real life, you can't just do that. Right? You can't just take things back. You can't just rewrite things. You can't go back and change things as you want to. And this is the big, li uh, big lesson that Bryony seems to be learning here, as I said, in part three. Her job as a nurse makes her really full-on on confront this reality. This is not something that can be easily fixed just by ch changing the story, just by imagination. It has to be through reality. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you, guys. Please uh, hand in your prep sheets as you go. And uh, I'll have a good weekend, and I'll see you on, on Monday. Thank you. <laughs>